morning. My name is Jack Price. I'm a volunteer here at Shenandoah National Park. In fact, I have, this is my 14th year as a volunteer. I'm also a certified Virginia Master Naturalist and a member of the Shenandoah National Park Association Board of Directors. And if you're not familiar with the association, this is the organization that operates the bookstores at Dickey Ridge and Bird Visitor Centers. And the proceeds from sales in those stores come back to help fund the interpretive and educational programs of the park, such as this film that you're seeing today. Uh, today we're going to be continuing the ongoing program that the park has to look at the spring ephemerals uh, as they emerge throughout the park. And today we'll be going up Hawksbill Mountain, the highest peak in the park. Hawksbill is 4,051 feet. And it's an interesting mountain. We'll be taking a look at some of the uh, geologic features along the way, some of the trees, and of course we'll be talking about uh, the spring ephemerals. Uh, right now we're getting ready to get down on the trail. And as you can see here, this is one of our first ones that we'll be seeing along the way. <clears throat> this is wild geranium. You can see it's a beautiful bright pink color. And this is in bloom now all along Skyline Drive, and it adds a really adds a touch of interest to the woodland and to the edge areas of the park. We have another plant here in the background, not quite in bloom, uh, but you can see the hanging florets here. This is early meadow rue, and when this blooms, the flowers will be hanging down about an inch or so. Uh, it's a real pretty plant, um, and <clears throat> excuse me, will be. Uh, will be blooming probably in another couple of weeks. We also have another interesting plant here and as you can see in many places we don't have to go too far to find wildflowers. This is a very delicate white flower called uh, Sweet Cecily. Uh, early Americans and Native Americans would use uh, chew on the roots of Sweet Cecily. It gives a root, a, a licorice anise uh, flavor as you uh, chew on the roots. This is a uh, plant I wanted to point out. This is another spring ephemeral, but it's not a native. This is garlic mustard. It's a non-native invasive. And you can see from looking at this plant, it's pretty much finished its bloom. When it blooms, it blooms with a cluster of white flowers at the tip of the uh, stalk. Uh, and this, this, seed, or this plant will invade a number of the areas where our spring ephemerals are. And what's interesting about garlic mustard it's a biennial, which means that it flowers on second year plants. Uh, this is one of the plants that the park is, has uh, control efforts on at various locations in the park uh, where they pull it uh, or treat it with herbicide. Uh, this is a plant you may feel when you're hiking that you're doing the park a favor if you see it and pull it, but you're not. Uh, garlic mustard, once it flowers, if you pull it, and do not bag it and carry it out, but leave it on the trail side, it will continue to go to seed. So uh, these plants are removed through the efforts uh, of the Park Service or uh, other organizations supporting the Park Service. This beautiful yellow flowering plant here is also a non-native. It's not invasive. It is early winter cress. It is a member of the, of the uh, mustard family. And this is a great early pollinator plant. You'll see it spotted throughout the understory here. Unlike garlic mustard, as I said, it's not invasive. It, it won't uh, overrun the habitat of some of the other wildflowers here in the park. Here's an area with the garlic mustard that I talked about just a moment ago. And you can see these plants, here are the seed pods forming here, and you can see the white flowers at the tips of the plant. And you can see there are a number of plants in this particular area. Here again is the early meadow rue, but the plant I really wanted to talk about is this one right here. This is a plant called Golden Alexanders, and it has an interesting name. The name comes from uh, the golden years of Alexander the Great, and it was named to honor uh, Alexander the Great, and who was, of course, a hero of the early Greeks. Uh, these flowers, if you notice, they're in kind of an um umbrella shape, and they're called an umbel, just for that name, or for that reason. And you can see that the umbel is uh, composed of a number of little tiny flowers on a number of heads. This is a pretty plant, and this is a native that grows throughout the understory here.
We've now come down the access trail from the parking lot here at uh, Hawksbill, and we are now emerging onto the Appalachian Trail. If you follow my left hand, we would be on our way to Mount Katahdin, Maine, and if you follow my right hand, we would be on our way to Springer Mountain, Georgia. Uh, for the purposes of our film today, we're going to neither place. We're just going about a mile up the trail here. So let's continue on our walk. As we go along, you'll notice hidden away in a number of locations here are these beautiful little blue violets. They're very common here in Shenandoah National Park. We have a wide variety of violets here in the park. The, the uh, common blue violet, white violets, yellow woodland violets, Canada violets, birdfoot violets. So uh, violets are a common understory plant here and uh, you have to look hard sometimes. Sometimes they're hidden in little niches like this one behind the rock, but they are beautiful little plants. Again, more violets down in this area hiding under in the understory here, under the uh, overhead of the plants above them. Now this is the first trillium we've seen. We're just a little bit late for trilliums. These were peak bloom, oh, about seven to ten days ago. And this is called Trillium grandiflora. This is a very common trillium in the understory here. Normally the flowers are snow white, but as they age they turn pink, which makes it very interesting. And trilliums have an interesting story. Uh, this flower, uh, as it uh, continues to age, will produce seeds. These seeds will drop onto the ground, and the seeds coverings have little nodes on them which ants find uh, to be an excellent food so they pick up the seeds and carry the seeds underground where ultimately they will germinate. They just eat the nodes, the, the tasty nodes on the surface of the seeds and they don't disturb the seeds. The thing with the trillium from the time that seed goes underground to the time it flowers can take up to six years. So this is why as you hike in Shenandoah National Park you want to be sure that you enjoy viewing the flowers, but do not pick them. It is against the law to pick them, and if you were to pick a trillium, you've ruined it for someone else. It will be about six years before that flower will show another flower. All right, let's continue on our walk here. This white blaze you can see on the tree, about two inches by six inches, this is an indicator that we are on the Appalachian Trail. Uh, all of the trail is blazed white. Park hiking trails here in Shenandoah are blazed blue, and if you're on a horse trail, then that's a trail both hikers and horses can go on, they will bla be blazed yellow, as are our fire roads. They are also blazed yellow, but when you see white blazes, you know you are on the Appalachian Trail. More Golan Alexanders. And you can see if you look off into the understory, you'll see a few trilliums there, again, past their peak. Uh, they're getting ready to start forming seeds. I'd like to point out the understory here. If you look at the trees, they're starting to leaf out. And if you look through the understory here, you'll see ferns starting to come up. These particular ferns are hay-scented ferns. But what we're observing is a, an ecosystem in transition. Uh, of course, the spring ephemerals bloom because they take advantage of the fact there are no leaves on the trees and the sunlight can get to the forest floor. As the trees slowly leaf out, and that sunlight gets reduced in intensity, the ferns will start to come through. And in, by June, this understory will no longer be dominated by spring ephemerals. It will be dominated by a variety of ferns. And they may be hay-scented ferns. 
They may be wood ferns, lady ferns, cinnamon ferns. There are a wide variety of ferns and you can see them throughout the understory and they will be the common plant we'll see here throughout the warm weather of the summer. These plants right in here are past their prime. This is a plant called blue cohosh. When these plants emerge as young plants, they get their name because the stems and the leaves have a bluish tint to them. The flowers are past, but you can see it, they're forming seeds. This plant has a beautiful little brownish yellow flower, uh, and it's one that you wouldn't normally notice. Uh, it's not spectacular, but this is an important wildlife food, and as far as humans are concerned, the entire plant is poisonous. So it's a plant uh, that if you were to see it in woodlands outside the park, you would want to leave it alone. But again, this is a clear indicator. You can see how the leaves are starting to yellow and the plant is going to seed. This is a clear indicator of the transition I just mentioned in the understory as the spring ephemerals fading out. And there are trilliums here that are, in, that are uh, showing uh, their uh, last legs and, and the ferns are starting to become the dominant plant here in the understory. Okay, while we're here, we're normally going to be talking about wildflowers, but this is one of the interesting trees I wanted to mention. Uh, this is birch. This is uh, yellow birch. While this one doesn't look too yellow right now, when these trees are young, they're very yellow, and it varies from location. Uh, this tree in the park is a high elevation tree. You generally will not see yellow birch uh, until you get above about 3,000 feet here in the park. It's a cold elevation tree. What's unique about these trees, and along with the black birch, which is a very common tree here in the park at all elevations, uh, these trees were once tapped like uh, sugar maples uh, for their, their sap. The sap was used as a uh, flavoring for uh, birch beer and other uh, drinks. We use artificial flavoring now, so that's no longer the case, but if you were ever to see one of these trees in the forest and it were, was damaged, you would notice how quickly how much sap actually bleeds from the tree. Uh, but again, this is a pretty unique tree here in the park, these uh, yellow birch. This is a black cherry, another important tree and common tree here uh, in Shenandoah. This is actually a pioneer tree. When these mountains were open, black cherries would have been one of the first trees you'd see. This is an older one, uh, and you can tell black cherry, if you look at the bark, it looks like small potato chips, but it's an important tree because of the fruit it produces later in the year. Uh, this tree will, f will flower with little white flowers, and the cherries are an important uh, food for black bears, for, uh, for deer, for a number of migrating bird species. Very important tree here in the park uh, to support wildlife. And standing in front of it is a, is a sadder story. This is an American, this is an ash tree, a, uh, a white ash. This is one of the trees that's being attacked by the emerald ash borer. And if you look up into the canopy, you can see this tree is dying. The canopy is very thin, a uh, number of dead branches up there. And probably by the end of this season, by the end of this, this year, this tree will be dead. Sadly, we are losing uh, our ash trees in the park. Uh, to uh, the emerald ash borer and it's only a matter of time before most of them are gone and, and we have to wait and see what uh, ultimately may replace them. This is, uh, these dead ash trees are not valueless to the park or to the wildlife. A dead tree that's standing is called a snag. When they hit the ground they're called, called a fallen log. But these will ultimately become homes to woodpeckers. Uh, they will come in here searching for grubs that will be starting to uh, lay, or insects that will start laying their eggs in the tree as it decays. Woodpeckers will clear holes and use them for nesting purposes. And when the woodpeckers are through, we have what we call uh, secondary nesters, and these will be chickadees and titmice and nuthatches that will come in and use the woodpecker nest. So these snags are valuable to the actually to the health of a, uh, of a good uh, forest or a good ecosystem. Uh, ideally, you want about three or four snags per square mile to have a, a healthy ecosystem.
right here, earlier I talked about the ferns becoming dominant in, in the uh, understory. And here we have two of the species. This is the hay-scented fern. These spread through rhizomes, underground stems, and they spread all over. And these ferns right here are Appalachian wood ferns, and these again will be one of the more dominant uh, ferns as we uh, as this uh, understory transitions. The uh, bird song that you're hearing is a scarlet tanager, and uh, scarlet tanagers are in the same family as robins, and. Uh, their song is often compared to a robin that has a cold. This wildflower right here, <clears throat> this is a plant called false Solomon seal and just shortly we're going to see Solomon seal and the big difference is uh, if you saw this plant without the flowers it would be nearly impossible to tell the difference the flowers make all the difference in the world fault Solomon seal has a cluster of flowers at the end of the stem Solomon seal has a series of bell-shaped flowers on the underside of the stem and a little ways up the trail here we'll get to see that and you'll see the difference but this is false Solomon seal and this plant gets its name uh, from King Solomon who apparently was uh, quite knowledgeable uh, on the use of medicinal plants so that plant was named in his honor As we look to the side of the trail here, we're seeing another species of violet here in the park. Uh, this is the Canada violet. And you can tell Canada violets, and again, these are a little bit past prime, but Canada violets are on a little bit taller stalk, and the back sides of the petals are purple. So that's a clear way you can tell the Canada violet from the other white violets uh, here in the park. All right, this tree right here is another interesting tree. These can get quite large, although this one uh, is an understory tree right here. This is linden or American basswood. Uh, these trees have some of the largest leaves of any tree in the park. But what makes this tree as significant is if you are a wood carver, probably 90% of the wood you carve in is linden or basswood. Uh, it's a hardwood, but it is extremely soft and, and pliable for carving but very strong for making uh, wood pieces out of. So, very popular tree amongst wood carvers. And right here in front of us, we have a maple that most people don't think about. In fact, we have two versions up here. Uh, this is called mountain maple. Uh, this is a shrub. Uh, most people have heard of red maple or sugar maple uh, or uh, silver maple, but most people are not aware of of these little shrubs. Uh, this is another member of the maple family uh, and you can see the, the leaves have a, a distinct maple shape to them. And over here, as we continue on up on the edge up here, this is striped maple. Now this one is more a tree and you can see the uh, mountain maple has five lobes on the leaves Striped maple only has three, but another member of the maple family, another understory tree. It also has the name of moosewood. So if you hear somebody in the Appalachians here talk about moosewood, they are talking about the striped maple. Okay, just a moment ago we saw false Solomon seal with the flowers at the tip of the plant. Now we have Solomon seal and you can see that the bell-shaped flowers are formed in a double row on the underside of the stem. And again, that's the way you tell the difference. Solomon seal, bell-shaped flowers under the, the uh, leaves on the stem, vault Solomon seal, a, a fuzzy 
flower uh, at the tip of the stem. And here's another great example of the ferns coming into their own on the under, in the understory here. As you can see, this area is pretty well shaded now, and, and that's just what these ferns like. Shade keeps the soil moist. Uh, it's ideal for them to grow and reproduce. Here we have a plant that's called fly poison. Uh, you can see the stalk of the flower just starting to emerge right here. This stalk will get, oh, about 24 inches or so tall, and the flower will look, if I can use the expression, like a bottle brush. Uh, it'll be very fuzzy. It'll be composite, composed of a number of small white flowers. I think you've heard on previous uh, tapes about how fly poison got its name. Uh, the roots would be ground up and put into milk and would be left out to attract the uh, flies in, in the uh, early settlers' homes, and the, uh, uh, they would drink the tainted milk and they would die. So that's one of those uh, ways a, a plant gets its name. And if you look underneath this plant, we have a little tiny plant that loves these dappled sun areas. It's called a bluet. It's a four-petaled flower, uh, very small. Uh, and what's interesting about these, these plants, because of their size, can't be pollinated by most bee pollinators because they're so fragile um, that they, the, the bees can't really land on them. They, the flowers will give way. So these are pollinated by what we call bee flies. These are flies that actually look like bees, but they have the ability to hover above the plant and they can dip their proboscis down into the flower to get the little bit of nectar that's in the, uh, in, down into the, in the flower. So, kind of a unique uh, situation, a unique relationship between the, the bee flies and the, uh, the bluets. Okay, here's a nice grouping of bluets. This is the typical situation. You'll see them in. They grow on roadsides along the trail. There just happens to be just a hair more sunlight in these areas, and that's what these plants like. But you can see how thin those stems are that even some of the smallest bees would cause this flower to collapse so the bee flies that can hover above them uh, will as I said be able to dip that proboscis down into the center of the flower and get the nectar that's down in there. Pretty little flowers and these will stay in bloom oh for another week or so up here. And here's another fly poison you can see the stalk of this flower is up just a little bit more than what we saw in the previous one. So these, again, will be in bloom in about two weeks or so. This is a, a uh, shrub, uh, and this is the rose azalea. These are in bloom at the highest elevations of the park now. They have finished their bloom at lower elevations. Um, as I'm standing here uh, holding this branch so you can see the flowers, the way the wind is blowing, I'm getting a lovely, sweet fragrance right off these flowers. The color of these flowers can vary from the uh, dark or the bright pink you see here to almost white. Uh, and if you look, the uh, reproductive parts of the flower are sticking out. Uh, those are the pistils and the stamens. Um, and that, these flowers are generally uh, pollinated by small butterflies uh, or other insects, a moth maybe. Uh, bees generally do not come into these flowers because of the way the stamens and, and pistils are arranged. Uh, they can't uh, come in contact with them to pick up the pollen. So it's a pollinator with wings that would actually pollinate these flowers. Wings like a butterfly or a moth. Okay, these plants right here that this ground cover that's hugging the ground uh, this is wild lily of the valley, or also known as Canada Mayflower. These are beyond bloom. Uh, they normally put up a short stalk, oh, about three or four inches tall, of white flowers. And if we were here when they were in full bloom a few weeks ago, you would have really noticed the sweet fragrance of these, uh, of these flowers. And again, you can see, as they're fading, these are the hay-scented ferns that are starting to come in here to dominate this understory. 
And as we talk here, I just noticed something else that's really another unique wildflower in the park here, and that's the jack in the pulpit. We have a little jack in the pulpit right here, and if you look into the center of the flower right there, you can see what we call the little jack. Um, and at the end of the season, that will form some red berries that will be, again, a popular wildlife food. But they like, jacks like these moist, uh, shaded areas to grow. Uh, they are a biennial. They will put up flowers in the second year. First year, they're hard to find because there is no uh, flower to look at. And they get their name from the uh, old uh, Puritan days where the preacher would stand in the pulpit with the cover over the pulpit uh, and preach to his congregation. And so we have the jack in the pulpit. Earlier in our walk, I had mentioned the, the yellow birch and then also its companion tree, the black birch. Well, here's a black birch, and you can see very different uh, from the yellow birch. Uh, young black birches especially are very difficult to tell uh, the difference from, from a very young cherry tree. So you almost have to scratch the bark a little bit to tell. A, a young cherry will have a very sour odor, and the black birch will smell like wintergreen, as will the yellow birch. And you can see that it gets its name from the color of the bark. This tree is also known as sweet birch or cherry birch. And like the uh, yellow birch, it was tapped for its sap as a flavoring uh, for birch beer. Uh, but if you notice something here, see these lateral horizontal marks right in here? These are called lenticels. Uh, they're not so significant or important for the older tree, but on young trees, it's another way the tree takes in oxygen. Um, or takes in uh, CO2, actually. Uh, you know, we humans have a symbiotic relationship with trees. Uh, we breathe out carbon dioxide, which trees breathe in, and they uh, exhale oxygen, which, of course, we need for our survival. So we have a real symbiotic uh, relationship and why trees are so important to our, our human species. All right, as I indicated earlier, we are on the Appalachian Trail and we thought we might run into a through hiker, and we have. Uh, we've run into this young lady here who is through hiking the Appalachian Trail, headed to Maine. Uh, and if I could ask, what is your trail name? Uh, my trail name is Penguin. And Penguin, where did you start from? And tell us a little bit about your experiences on the trail so far. Yeah, I started at Springer Mountain in Georgia. Um, started March 19th, so I'm a little over two months in. Um, and it's just been beautiful. I've had great weather for the most part and the parks and the, the whole trails has been magical. Great. How long do you anticipate it'll take you to get to Maine? Um, I'm hoping to be done in the middle of August, so okay. about five months or a little okay. bit less. Yeah, because I know you're not quite halfway. Southern Pennsylvania is about the halfway point, so. Yep. Have you run into any unique experiences while you've been out? Um, Oh gosh, unique experiences. I feel like every day is a unique experience. Okay. You just meet so many cool people and yeah. all the views. Um, some wildlife mm -hmm. have had a bear kind of skirt my perimeter of my campground, which was okay. a, little, a little stressful, but it was fine. But for the most part, um, just every day has been a unique and amazing experience. All right, well, thank you, Penguin. Penguin is a uh, veteran. She's an, a, a, an Afghanistan uh, war veteran. And I want to thank Penguin for her service and her time in talking to us this morning. Yeah, thank you. While we're talking plants along the trail here, uh, I did not want to miss the opportunity to talk a little geology. Uh, this is a prime example of what we call columnar jointing lava flow. This is the park's metabasalt. This is from an ancient lava flow. This rock here probably dates back at least half a billion years. Um, and if you can imagine a rock that's up this way and then was slowly tilted over uh, through continental collision about 300 million years ago. And these columns form as the uh, lava cools, much like if you see a, a muddy spot and you see how a mud hole uh, dries up and cracks. Same thing here with lava. This top surface will cool and start to crack and then it will cool slowly down through. 
our meta basalt here is basically the same type rock you'll find in Hawaii only this is also called greenstone and it gets its color from cordite uh, that this is done under this is a metamorphic rock uh, it gets its color deep underground under extreme pressure and heat as water under those conditions is forced through the rock and the cordite uh, intermix mixes with the crystals in the rock and and forms this uh, this green stone. So um, this is a really nice example of what a columnar jointing rock flow looks like. All right, as we hike along the Appalachian Trail here on Hawksbill, the trail crosses three talus fields or rock debris fields, and this is the first one. And as you look up at this rock debris field, what you're seeing is an erosion of the cliff face that's behind the trees up there and you're looking at basically millions of years of erosion and you're looking at two types of erosion what we call uh, mechanical uh, weathering uh, and chemical weathering uh, in the case of mechanical weathering what happens is uh, as these rocks on the cliff face uh, have water seep down in the cracks and that water freezes into form ice. We all know that ice ex water expands as it forms ice so it widens the crack a little bit more and over the years and it may take hundreds or thousands of years that crack will be wide enough to chip off a big chunk of rock and down it will come to this talus field. And if you look on the rock you'll see moss and lichens. That's a good example of of uh, chemical weathering. The chemicals that these uh, uh, plants uh, emit will slowly wear this rock down. And if you could be standing around this spot about 30 or 40 million years from now, probably most of this uh, talus field will be gone. Uh, we like to think mountains are permanent, but they are not. Uh, the Blue Ridge Mountains here, uh, Hawksbill, uh, at one time, these mountains were probably as high as the Rocky Mountains, maybe as high uh, as the uh, Himalayas. And you're basically, as you come to the park and you see these beautifully rounded, treed mountains, you're looking at about 250 to 300 million years of uh, weathering and, and erosion going on here. Okay, as we uh, are looking, or, or as we're standing on this talus field, I noticed the new... Uh, plant just emerging. This is a summer bloomer and this is Allegheny stone crop. The only, about the only place you'll find it here in the park is up on these talus fields. It likes to grow in these rocky fields and in, in shallow soils. Uh, it likes the more extreme temperatures up here, uh, cooler summers, colder winters. And if you look at the plant, the leaves are very fleshy uh, and it's a summer bloomer. Uh, in probably late June or so, uh, this plant will have spread quite a bit and produced some beautifully uh, pink flowers uh, that you can't miss as you hike the trails uh, and cross these uh, uh, talus fields here in the Shenandoah National Park. Okay, and as we look at the stone crop and we stand up and look, we see a, another tree that's exclusive to these higher elevations in the park, and this is the mountain ash. Uh, kind of nondescript now, you'll see it's a uh, what we call a compound pinnate leaf, a uh, number of leaflets to make up the leaf, but notice these green flower heads uh, that are starting to come out now. When this tree is in full bloom uh, later in the summer uh, and later in the year, it will produce a crop of bright orange berries and you cannot at that point miss uh, these uh, mountain ash. They're, you'll see how uh, prolific they are all over the park with these bright orange berries that will come from these fairly nondescript flowers when they bloom. Uh, we're just on the other side of the rock outcrop and I wanted to point out uh, we're on the edge of it. Uh, these ferns that you see growing along the rock here, uh, these are called polypody ferns and their typical habitat is on the surface of rocks. They spread on the moss that grows on the, on the rocks and if you look at these ferns You'll notice the dark color and you'll notice a number of them shriveled. These plants are under drought stress. Uh, we've had a very dry spring here in Shenandoah National Park. Normally this area, when, I, when you come up here, if you look at this rock shelf here, it's dripping water uh, even in the summer. So I know it's been dry when I see that there's no water uh, dripping off that rock shelf here and the plants are under a lot of drought stress. Uh, hopefully we have some rain coming in in the coming week and that will relieve some of the stress that we're seeing on the plants here. Um, and if we look down here at ground level, 
you notice these little plants growing here. These are called blue bead orchids, excuse me, blue bead lilies, and they are not quite in bloom yet. You can see the buds forming and you can see the little flower forming. It's a yellowish uh, green flower. And these are interesting plants because of their name. They get the name blue bead orchid because when that flower is finished and the plant goes to seeds, it produces little seeds that are about the size of a pea and the color of blue. So it gets that name blue bead orchid. But even more interesting is the plant's scientific name. Uh, and the scientific name is Clintonia borealis. And the name itself doesn't sound interesting, but it was named after Governor DeWitt Clinton, who was governor of New York from 1769 to 1828. So imagine being governor of a state for 59 years. So it was named in his honor. And the borealis comes from the, the term aurora borealis, it, it indicates that this plant only grows in the northern hemisphere. So while none of you may remember Latin names, you might remember Clintonia borealis because it is such a, a unique name and such a unique flower. Uh, and these are usually late May, early June bloomers, and as I said, you can see they're just starting to form their, their flower heads, and they do form a small lily-shaped uh, flower. Okay, again, we're right on the edge of the uh, talus field, um, and this is another very interesting plant up here. This is called Sarsaparilla, um, and it's interesting for a number of reasons. Number First, the leaves and the seeds and the flowers grow on separate stalks. So you can see here are the leaf stalks, and if you look underneath, these are the seeds forming. This, these plants, again, as spring moves on, they're past the flowering stage. This produces a little yellowish, whitish flower. Uh, but what's more important, these, all these flower heads will now become a purplish black berry. And those berries are a favorite food of black bears. And botanists have found that these seeds that are, are eaten by the bears, or the berries that are eaten by bears, are two to three more times likely to grow plants than seeds that don't pass through the digestive system of a bear. So that's a, a case of what we call mutualism, where both uh, bodies uh, benefit. The bear benefits uh, from getting food, and the plant benefits from having its seeds uh, distributed in the bear stool as the bear uh, moves around and, and defecates. So uh, it's again a case of mutualism and another interesting uh, situation of the relationship between uh, plants and wildlife here in Shenandoah National Park. Earlier we talked about the white blaze on the Appalachian Trail. This is a blue blaze on the park hiking trails. So you can see the difference. Uh, we're now on the Lower Hawksbill Trail. We've uh, left the Appalachian Trail. And I wanted to point out this fern. This is one of my all-time favorite ferns. In fact, I like it so much I have it growing at my house. This is called a cinnamon fern. It grows to about three to four feet in height. And it gets its name from this stalk that you see right here. Uh, cinnamon fern puts out a whole group of fronds, but one frond, or one stem in the fronds on that, contain the spores. And uh, if you're not familiar, ferns don't reproduce through with seeds, they reproduce with spores. And this is the stalk that contains the spores, and it's the one that gives the plant the name cinnamon fern because the uh, spores look uh, color-wise and size-wise just like cinnamon. So here is your cinnamon fern, and you'll find these again throughout the understory here as the uh, uh, spring ephemerals give way slowly to the ferns. And this will be one that you'll see throughout this area here, the, the cinnamon fern. Another plant that's growing along the lower Hawksbill Trail here, and this one is one of our native vines. Uh, this is called yam root. Uh, it's, it's one of those vines that I call kind of friendly. It doesn't grow more than well, I've read it can grow up to 30 feet. To be honest, I've never seen it more than about 8 or 10 feet uh, in length. It's a seasonal vine. Uh, it gets its name from its roots, obviously, yam root. The roots are often harvested. They have to be treated, and they are edible. Uh, again, I've been told that uh, when you chew on the roots, they do give you kind of a licorice flavor. 
The roots from this vine often show up in a variety of herbal remedies. Uh, if you look in the, in the content, you'll see yam root listed. Uh, I'm not quite certain for all what remedies it's in there for, but it is on, in a number of herbal remedies. But it is one of the native vines, and it's kind of a pretty little vine. I have it growing at my house in different spots, and I really enjoy it. You can see, if you look, there are little tendrils here. It produces a little tiny, uh, very small white flower. Uh, you wouldn't notice it unless you were looking for the vine itself. So. Okay, well this concludes our uh, wildflower uh, and plant tour and geology tour on Hawksbill Mountain. I want to thank all of you for coming and for viewing. Uh, I hope in the future if you get to come to Hawksbill you will take the hikes up here and enjoy the wildflowers. While we saw a lot of things today and we identified a number of plants, we really only scratched the surface. Uh, Hawksbill, as with the rest of the park, uh, as the seasons go along, there are a number of wonders to take. And I, I hope you'll uh, have the time to come and, and visit with us. And again, thank you for your time and attention.